This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Professor Peter Hegarty from the University of Surrey. Um, Peter's asked me to remind you that he's not a historian by training, <laughs> but rather a psychologist. Um, he's professor in psychology at Surrey University, and he's the head of, head of the department there. He's held visiting fellowships or professorships at the City University of New York, Yale, and Michigan. Peter's work aims to bring three fields into closer dialogue, social psychology, the history of science, and gender and sexuality studies. Uh, Peter's monograph was published in 2013 with Chicago University Press, Gentleman's Disagreement, Alfred Kinsey, Lewis Terman, and the Sexual Politics of Smart Men. He's published widely on topics including sexism, cisgenderism, lesbian caregivers, psychology's history of power, the role of identity and behavior in homophobia and transphobia, and on queer theory. Peter's also worked on bridging the divide between lesbian, gay, and bisexual psychology in the academy, and that in the voluntary sector and in therapeutic psychology. And Peter's talk tonight is entitled The Denaturalization of Sexuality in 21st Century Psychology. Okay. Thanks, Peter. Thank you very much, Craig. Um, thank you all very much for coming out tonight to sit in a, a small room on a hot day in the middle of London. That's very nice of you. Um, and thanks also for the patience of those of you who thought I was going to give this talk in January. Uh, before I fainted in my office very dramatically a few days beforehand and had to call it off. Um, so I'm, I'm very grateful to be invited here. Um, it feels really nice to be here and to be in this building um, giving this talk. I spent many, 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 many days in Senate House Library writing Gentlemen's Disagreement. Uh, and so it feels very, very nice to come back and, and talk about a little bit about uh, what I hope might be the next project. Um, so, as Craig said, I'm, I'm not a historian, um, I'm a psychologist who occasionally masquerades as one, and who has on occasion had uh, historians who shall remain nameless say, oh, I never would have noticed you're not a historian. Um, so I do sometimes describe myself as a historian of psychology, and because in my day-to-day -day job that includes things like teaching modules on the history of psychology to undergraduates at Surrey. I also uh, sometimes teach advanced modules that engage students with more taxing questions um, that history poses to psychology as a discipline, as a profession, and as a social movement. Um, I have supervised professional placements for undergraduate students in the curatorial division of the Science Museum and supervised original work by PhD students um, and going forward by a postdoctoral fellow. Uh, but my disciplinary allegiances are not at all clear um, and I I'm also involved throughout all of this in research on the social cognition of history that many historians would find irkingly positivist. Um, so I might have once passed as a historian, but I'm definitely not going to try and do that tonight. Now, how did people like me get to exist? How did we get to have historians of psychology where that became to be a meaningful bit of work to teach history to psychology students? Early, by which I mean late 19th and early 20th century psychologists, often incorporated notions of historical time into their work and considered that history lived through the individual psyche in various ways. Many of you could think call to mind his Freud's historical works, Totem and Taboo, Civilization and Discontents, Moses and Monotheism and things of that sort. Also, you could consider G. Stanley Hall, the first American to get a PhD in psychology on American soil, with William James at Harvard, of course, and the 1890s period of um, child study that he conducted, in which the ontology of child development was so often said to recapitulate evolutionary and cultural history. Other founders of psychology, of course, wrote extensively about history, religion, myth, and so on. You might think of Wilhelm Wundt, um, for whom the question of what is psychological was not necessarily contained within the laboratory, but also centered on Volker psychology or folk psychology. These questions about what is or is not historic, what is or is not psychological that can be approached with, with, from a scientific point of view, have then been with psychology from the very start, and I think are part of it. In the 1920s, particularly in the United States, psychology took a much more practical and applied direction, um, both because of the rise of behaviorism as a school of thought and because of the success of the IQ testing movement and inserting testing in many areas of educational life. <coughs> 
At this point in time, the teaching of psychology became organized as a field of science, and its history of its development began to be talked about and taught to students as a history of great men and developments uh, towards a scientific achievement. I'm thinking here of the work of E.G. Boring, uh, which set the tone for how the history of psychology would be taught for about half a century. And in my work on Lewis Terman, I also came across a paper of his in which he argued the uh, Pacific Historical Society that soon all of history would be reduced to a matter of personality and intelligence testing. Um, in the great expansion of the discipline of psychology after World War II, um, with the growth in clinical psychology, history was bedded into the discipline yet further. And certainly in the United States, it was a requirement that scientist practitioner training to doctoral level in clinical psychology required an education in the history of the field. Now in the 1960s, uh, like so many kind of things, this sort of history became gradually critiqued as insufficiently critical. It was described as internalist, presentist, naive, hagiographical about great men, and so on and so forth. And the work of Robert Young, George Stocking, uh, stands out here. Particularly important, of course, is also the work of Thomas Kuhn, who gave psychologists a way of thinking about history that was not necessarily one of incremental progress, but one of continuous revolutions. And the psychologists who were leading the charge away from behaviorism towards cognitive psychology in the late 1960s, early 1970s, particularly embraced Kuhn's notion of revolutionary change as a way of making sense of what they were doing themselves. <laughs> In part because of uh, generous funding, the field of the history of psychology began to professionalise in a new way in the late 1960s. And markers of this include the formation of the Society Chiron, the Society for the History of the Behavioural Sciences, uh, the New Journal for the History of the Behavioural Sciences, and the foundation of the Archives of the History of American Psychology at the University of Akron, Ohio, which is currently closed for an upgrade, uh, suggesting that scholarship on the history at least of American psychology will continue for quite some time. So in the 1970s and the 1980s, supported by new journals, societies and archives, uh, there was a considerable shift away from this kind of great man narrative of psychology and of psychology as cumulative science. This turn was also caught up with various crises of confidence about psychology's scientific legitimacy itself, as, and a turn away from the form of value-neutral science that had been promoted since World War II. For example, there was increasing interest in gender, uh, both in psychology and in its history people turned to examine the history of women foremothers in psychology in the first era, in the first wave of feminism, as well as looking at representations of gender in psychoanalysis, evolutionary theory, and a bit later on within experimental psychology itself. There was increased interest in race, um, both in the early history of IQ and race and its interdigitation with the eugenics movement, and that was particularly sparked by things like the Cyril Burt controversy in this country and the resurgence of arguments about the biological basis um, of IQ differences in the US. You could think of Stephen Jay Gould's The Mismeasure of Man as a late contribution to this development. And thirdly, there was increasing contestation of psychiatric power, um, with both with anti-psychiatric critiques um, and as psychoanalysis began to lose power, particularly within American psychiatry, um, and lost power to more empirical approaches um, in terms of determining or understanding of what a mental illness was. So you might think of others as well here as well. But the important point I want to make is that there were co-occurring shifts in thinking, both about issues in psychology and shifts in rethinking narratives of psychology's past and where those points of erasure might have been in there. Um, it's also important to note that many of these more critical forms of thought, I think, had only a, a loose relationship at this point in time with this professionalised field of the history of psychology. So if you want to know where the interesting work on gender was published in the 70s and 80s, it's often not in the Journal for the History of Behavioural Sciences, but in more general um, journals which would have been read by a large number of psychologists, such as the American Psychologist, or a bit later on, Psychology of Women Quarterly. In the 1990s, a constructivist turn, enabled on the one hand by post-structuralist scholarship, uh, led to new questions about the stability of the subject of psychology itself. Kurt Danziger uh, conducted extensive studies of the history of methodology that constructed the subject. Jill Murawski called attention to the androcentrism, which is built into non-reflexive research relationships between knowers and known subjects in psychology. And in this country, scholars such as Roger Smith and Graham Richard asked big questions about what is and what is not addressed by the history of psychology. And in particular, Graham Richard's distinction between psychology with a small p, those ways of thinking about personhood which may be circulating in a culture, 
and psychology with a big P, those things which might be professionalised in some ways, is a useful uh, and unstable dichotomy to work with. Also in the 1990s, there was an increased range of journals within which uh, professional history of psychology be published. History of the Human Sciences from 1988, Theory and Psychology from 1991, and the American Psychological Association's History of Psychology in 1998. Now a much broader conversation about the purpose of the history of psychology as a project was happening. Um, also, this was in part due to a rise in interest in psychology in social history. People who'd been trained in social history and who'd never navigated their way through psychology departments at all. Um, but who had recognised that psychology was an important movement um, in modernity and so who were contributing to um, understandings of it. And here I'm thinking of the work of people like Ellen Herman, John Carson uh, or Mike Pettit. Now as we're in the 1990s in this little story of mine, uh, perhaps it's a useful point to put myself back into it and step out of that funny role of the unbiased observer who looks at history as if they didn't live in it themselves. I was studying for a PhD in psychology in the 1990s in the United States, having migrated there from Ireland. And I had little direct exposure to any of this historical research as a result of anything that I was taught in the classroom. Um, to understand the discipline of social psychology, one of my PhD advisors helpful, helpfully pointed me towards some sources on the history of race in the United States, which plugged small gaps in a gaping maw of my ignorance and made me all the more convinced that objects of psychological knowledge were, in some important sense, historical. As I turned to sexuality, the prejudice experienced by lesbians and gay men, and the ways that heteronormativity shaped narratives of development in psychology, I became increasingly aware that I needed history, and for several reasons. First of all, the objects that I was studying, which were things like the relationship between changing dynamics of homophobia in the 1990s, and changing beliefs in the biological base of sexual orientation had historical foreshadowings in other periods that contained lessons for the present. For example, the attempts of Magnus Hirschfeld to win rights in late 19th century Germany appeared to have a lot to do with the optimism surrounding biological models of male sexuality in the, 19, in the United States in the 1990s. Secondly, the present in which I was working was also, in some very obvious ways, itself historical. For example, those same biological theories in the 1990s were in diverse ways shaped by the experiences um, of the United States, and particularly of gay and bisexual men within it, with HIV AIDS. Um, and that made their dynamics, of course, quite historically specific. Third, following the arguments of social constructionist scholars in psychology, particularly Kenneth Gergen, history became a place from which to inquire about the relationship between psychology's actual research practices, some of which I was apprenticing and learning, and psychology's objectivist rhetoric, which seemed to me to not necessarily map onto what I was doing in the laboratory at all. So, for example, when we measure something like heterosexism or homophobia with an attitude measure in psychology, uh, we can note the fact that these measures have been recently invented in specific time and places, and that they encode normative beliefs about what is a rational, non-prejudiced way to think about lesbians and gay men. So Celia Kitzinger's radical feminist arguments about these points, as well as Franz Samuelson's points about the ways in which the psychology of racism had been invented in an earlier generation and after World War II, were very influential to me. Now, with the kind encouragement of some friendly historians and anthropologists, I began to turn what were half-formed thoughts into conference papers and eventually into articles, and became one of several people who began to connect the history of psychology um, with the history of sexuality towards the late 1990s and into the 2000s. Other people who did this kind of work and I think made contributions uh, to the history of psychology literature, and I don't just mean here people who are publishing in the history of sexuality and humanities journals, but who are publishing the kind of journals that psychologists might read, would include people like Jennifer Terry, Mike Pettit, Henry Minton, of course, Laura Ball, Meg Gibson, and Howard Chiang. In various articles, I described how the use of the Rorschach test to detect homosexuality had been um, had risen and fallen with changes in what that test meant more generally, looked at uh, attempts of psychiatrists to wrestle with Harry Stack Sullivan's closet after his death and other kinds of things. And all that culminated in the 2013 book Gentleman's Disagreement, uh, which was a genealogy of the relationship between sexuality and intelligence and norms for masculinity in the early to mid-20th century. Um, in the abstract for this talk tonight, I put in a bit of a teaser of a couple of lines at the start about Foucault and disciplinary power. Um, and I just want to kind of start there before I get into the current project. 
um, to, to sort of explain what that was about, really. Um, in Gentleman's Disagreement, this, I, I took a very genealogical approach to this. Um, and like, I quite honestly did it. I started this book in 2003. It took me 10 years to do. I did it on my Saturdays in the library. Um, I had no idea what the book was going to look like when I started it. This is an absolutely terrible way to have a career. Yeah. I have repetitive strain injury. I wrote it on a laptop. You know, horrible, horrible, not the way to do it at all. Which is what genealogy is all about, and it was, uh, it is what it is. And and in there, you know, I kind of there was two Foucauldian ideas that I was working with. One Foucault's theories about power and psychology. Another the the idea that genealogy should trouble the moral and epistemological certainties of the present. And the second one won, um, by and large. And I ended up challenging um, some of the ways that we think about psychology and disciplinary power, or certainly the way that many people have come to read Foucault and psychology. Um, so the, Foucault has been read in psychology in quite a dark way to suggest that there is no possibility of agency in power um, and that you know, power always wins in some kind of structural way. And the notion of disciplinary power looms large there. Um, that's no accident, of course, because in Foucault's genealogies... So the, the work I'm, I'm beginning now, um, I mean, just want to gesture towards the, the last book here to say um, this, is, this work kind of... Uh, blew apart for me some, some Foucauldian readings of psychology and got me thinking about what the history of psychology could contribute and, and say back to Foucauldian readings. Uh, in particular, the idea that categories that are constructed by and through the psychological disciplines are necessarily bound up in disciplinary power, um, that work to normalise the kinds of people that they construct seem to me to be very problematic when working on categories like genius and particularly the category of the gifted child which is invented very much in the 1920s through IQ testing. Um, gifted children get caught up in all sorts of interesting forms of power, um, it's certainly true, um, but they are not disciplined in the sense that their abnormality is not something that's worked on and moved towards the norm, quite the opposite. Um, so it got me thinking about how different forms of normativity, one that sort of orients people towards averages might adhere in a socially conservative way around some kinds of things like sexuality and other kinds of normativity that move us all towards those rare ideal types might adhere around other kinds of psychological categories like intelligence, for example. But um, that's enough on that. The new work which I'm just beginning and which is just going to be a couple of broad brushstrokes tonight engages with um, a contemporary predicament in the history of psychology that's been noted by Alex Rutherford, Mike Pettis and some others. And this is that given the burst in writing and support for professionalism in the history of psychology in the late 1960s and early 70s, there remains a tendency to see the past of psychology ending somewhere in the 1970s, around the time when cognitive psychology overtook behaviourism as the dominant approach in experimental psychology. And yet, for jobbing psychologists like myself, um, it seems obvious that we are not in the cognitive revolution of the 1970s and 80s anymore. And as such, our history of psychology textbooks and our course books, I think, do not yet equip our students to grapple with the complex challenges of the present and the near future. This is not only a temporal problem, of course, it's also a spatial one. Since the 1970s, several forms of critical psychology have flourished largely outside of the USA, and many of them deploy history as a form of critique in various ways. So it's now possible, as Thomas Teo argues, to tell a history of psychology, not by the history of its boldest and most ambitious claims, but instead a history of the criticisms levelled against the possibility of psychology from Immanuel Kant to contemporary postcolonial critics. Now, as Donna Hayter and I argue, in an exchange with the discourse analysts Margaret Weatherall and Jonathan Potter, forthcoming in the next issue of, Discor of Theory and Psychology, a failure to critically historicize recent forms of psychology, such as discourse analysis, might leave critical psychologists with a yardstick of criticality set against 1970s norms, a low bar against which many moves, which may be quite conservative in some ways, uh, might be successfully rhetorically presented as critical psychologies. So a history of recent psychology should then raise the bar for what critical interventions in psychology might look like. So it seems obvious to me, and I'm, I'm hoping I'm pushing against an open door with this audience tonight, that a recent history of sexuality uh, might be a very useful way to move forward an understanding of recent's present. Uh, that is the history that, as Claire Potter said, is just over our shoulders. 
Um, from the 1970s, gender, sexuality, culture, ethics, neuroscience, genetics, healthy behavior, cyber psychology, big pharma, social constructionism, and public understandings of science are all key watchwords in 21st century psychology that simply were just not part of the lexicon in the same way in the 1970s. So in this talk, I just want to briefly talk about um, recent movements and so get your thoughts as to whether this is a good idea uh, to get psychologists to think about the recent present by getting them to think about sexuality. So to do this, I'm going to talk about two um, studies in a little bit of depth. Um, and I think each of them marks the beginning of what I'm beginning to think of as periods in recent history, uh, where particular theories about the nature of sexuality became uh, very changed. Yep, that's the one. So in the early 1990s, there was a series of very strong claims uh, put forward about the biological basis of sexuality, particularly male sexual orientation. Um, I'm thinking particularly of the following trio of studies. The 1991 study on behavioral genetics by psychologist Michael Bailey and psychiatrist Richard Pollard. The 1991 study on the neuroanatomy of the anterior hypothalamus by Simon LeVay. And the 1993 genetic linkage study by Dean Hamer and his colleagues uh, whilst, and while these are certainly not the most recent moves in the history of psychology, they are perhaps a useful vantage point from which to begin. So the first thing I want to note is that these studies had rapid impact. Um, the historian of psychology, Gail Hornstein, a sometime visitor to these shores, uh, once called psychology textbooks X-rays of the uncontroversial uh, in the history of psychology. <laughs> And in an analysis of psychology textbooks published in the 1990s and the 2000s, Meg John Barker, who is here tonight, uh, noted that these biological studies were very rapidly uh, taken up and used to present to psychology undergraduates the view that sexual minorities are most interesting to them because they illustrate and anchor nature-nurture debates. Most of the time this presentation occurred through a very binary presentation um, of sexuality that erased bisexual people altogether, and most of the time with very little additional content about what the lives of sexual minorities might be uh, beyond the fact that they are the target of a nature-nurture debate. In more public fora, these studies created celebrity. As Jennifer Terry rightly noted in 1997, Simon LeVay particularly set a new paradigm of the openly gay public scientist that had not previously existed. And more internal to the discipline than either this kind of public representation of the science or even the undergraduate textbooks, these biological studies had a range of supporters and critics in psychology. But before going on to that, I want to pause and look at how these studies could be read um, as products of their time. And so I'm going to use LeVay's study as an example here. So this graph, which hopefully is, a, is somewhat clear from the back of the room, shows you the key result in this study. And these are measures, measurements of the volume of four nuclei of the anterior hypothalamus called ionic H1 through to 4. Um, and there are three groups of people here who are identified as F, female, male, which means they're male and presumed to be heterosexual, and HM, uh, male and presumed to be homosexual. Um, so th how can we look at this kind of object and think about it historically? Well, certainly at the time that this study was produced, a lot, there was quite a bit of social and cultural discourse about it, and there's lots from the time to draw upon. The first question is about the materiality of the body itself. The INAH nuclei have a very interesting history. They had been ontologized as the INAH nuclei only about two years before this study was published by LeVay's colleague, Laura Allen. INAH1 is also known, and was known at this point in time, as the sexually dimorphic nucleus, uh, and was seen to be an analog of sexually dimorphic nuclei um, that are thought to be related to sexual behavior in animals. Um, it is also at this point in time that we start to see uh, brain imaging used to ask questions about gender in new sort of ways, and I think it's important to read LeVay in that kind of way. Second question is, is what does it mean to measure a part of a brain? What does it mean to look at the size of a brain part? Um, LeVay has used one measure here, which is a measure of um, volume, right? But there's actually many different ways to measure volume, um, and he used only one of them. Some alternatives were presented by others and used in critiques. Um, is this then a question about materiality or not? Um, when I first read this study, um, I was interested in this question and I talked to one of my cognitive neuroscientists uh, colleagues, a chap called John Gabrielli, 
um, who told me quite a lot about different ways that brain nuclei could be measured in the mid-1990s. And then I went to him and said, where can I read about this? Because I want to write this paper about Levay. And he said, oh, well, you won't be able to read about it. It's just something that neuroscientists know. <laughs> um, which I think that has changed since that time, but I think it's useful, of course, to remember that with scientific practice, there's always a certain amount of lore that doesn't get writ written down um, that excludes people who are looking at this from the outside. One of Levay's most trenchant biological critics was William Bine, and in a later study in 2001, Bine et al. Um, measured these nuclei again in um, women um, and men who varied by, by sexuality. And they showed a trend towards a smaller volume of this key INAH3, uh, but it wasn't a statistically significant one. Interestingly, they also failed to replicate the finding of a sexual dimorphism in INAH1. Um, third thing that's new here, I think, is the imaging of the brain. And LeVay's study needs to be read as part of a cluster of studies that, that, demonstrate, that demonstrated and argued um, that gender could be explained by looking at the effects of prenatal hormones on the organisation of the brain. Um, fourth, the question of replication looms large in this work, particularly because of Bynes' later study, but also because the question of replication and its relationship to objectivity in psychology has not been stable over the last 25 years. In this study, LeVay involved, does what's called null hypothesis statistical testing, um, However, his methods of doing that could be contested uh, in contemporary psychology. Um, were he to publish that by some of the standards that are now present in psychology, he would have had to have specified his null hypotheses in advance, used post hoc corrections, and as a result would have not found a statistically significant result at all. Um, for fifth, there is here the question of difference in identity. At the time that this study was published, there was considerable issue of two issues in particular. Uh, one is this person here, um, who is in the homosexual group, but who's actually a self-identified bisexual man. Um, and so the questions about the erasure of bisexuality and the construction of a binary model of sexuality, uh, which is at odds with the way that the participants describe themselves to large for many people. The other is the question of the effects of HIV AIDS on the brain. This study was only doable and the sexual orientation of men was only encodable because it was written into medical records of these people before they died um, as a result of the way that that was done in the context of HIV AIDS. Um, that's also the reason why sexual orientation is known for men and is not known for women in this study. And finally, there is of course considerable discussion of gender. Should this study be read as explaining sexual orientation for all um, such that female sexuality is simply a mirror image of male sexuality, as LeVay sometimes assumed and sometimes wrote, um, or should we adopt something more like a gender difference paradigm? This question would loom large a bit later on. But I just want to show you a couple of other images before we do move on, to show that this question about the relationship between sexuality and HIV was very much around in the neuroscience of the 1990s. So a couple of later studies, this one by Alan and Gorski in 1992 um, on the interior commissure, and this one here by Richard Schwab and colleague looking at the brains of uh, transsexual people. And in both of those studies, care was taken to try and parcel out the possible effects of HIV um, on the brain. So these studies in some ways, I think, show us sexuality moving from a scientific framework where it's understood very much through HIV AIDS science and shifting into one in the 1990s where it's going to be understood more through neuroscience and genetics and things like that. What were its effects on psychology? I think let's look at four. First of all, let's look in the field of social psychology. This is home turf for me. Um, social psychologists are, were interested in this work um, because they were interested in LGB people, particularly LG people, um, as a stigmatised minority and had been since the early 1970s when the diagnosis of homosexuality had been repealed. Um, in various ways, LeVay's persona helped this. LeVay, Michael Bailey and others argued that this work would bring about social change and would reduce prejudice by teaching people that sexuality was biologically determined and therefore was not anybody's personal fault. Um, several studies followed in the 1990s, which showed a strong correlation between belief in the biological theory um, of sexuality rather than a nurture theory or a choice theory, and support for lesbian and gay rights or simply attitudes towards lesbians and gay men. Um, 
I'm not sure if historians would jump up and down in horror here at the conflation of correlation with causation, but certainly undergraduate psychologists are trying to do that, uh, but that's another question. One thing I think that's very interesting and missing from the discourse at this point in time is very little talk within the mainstream of psychology um, of this as a form of essentialism. Um, it, by 1990, cognitive psychologists, developmental psychologists, and social psychologists were all developing research on essentialist thinking, um, a form of reasoning in which a complex set of um, traits are thought to be caused by a single, hidden, mysterious cause. This is clearly an essentialist argument about something as complex as sexuality. Uh, but this was not connected at all um, with the discussion of this research in the 1990s. There, were, there was no overlap. Um, so this is the sort of thing people were trying to explain, was the fact that um, essentialist beliefs were in fact changing over time, as um, sexual prejudice was by some measures reducing in the United States as well. So there seemed to be a cause and effect relationship here. Second, um, no, let me skip over that. Um, yes, I'll skip over all of that. Second area where we see this happening is the psychology of gender. Gender was relevant in, in several ways to this research that are obvious. First of all, there was a sampling um, of men for sexual orientation more than women. Secondly, um, in LeVay's study particularly, um, the model of male homosexuality was that the male homosexual had a brain that had the same shape as a heterosexual woman's brain. So this was a, a return to gender inversion theory. And in the late 1980s, social psychologists such as Mary Kite and Kate Doe had begun to study the gender inversion theory as a form of stereotyping for the first time. The third reason that this was about gender um, was that the theory was in some ways mother blaming. Although one of the promises of this theory is that it would remove us from guilt and shame and blame and all of those kinds of things that values bring around with them, um, Dean Hamer's work particularly noted that if male homosexuality was going to be um, inherited, it was going to be inherited on genes that were linked to the X chromosome and that were inherited through the mother. Um, later work on the genetics of male homosexuality would fail to um, replicate this finding. But I think this is important, and commentators such as Nancy Ordover and others noted how this returned the question of mother blame, albeit by a different, more biologized lens. And fourth, as I've noted, the idea that male and female sexuality are mirror images of each other in a kind of androcentric theory uh, versus the idea that they might be different. This graph is drawn from, um, or by E. Ching, Lee, and Mary Crawford, um, and it shows the proportion of papers archived in the, in the database PsychInfo uh, that are about various sexual minority groups, uh, lesbians, gay men, bisexual men, and bisexual women, um, over, starting earlier but sort of going into the 1990s. Um, the point here I want to pull out is both that there is quite a bit of underrepresentation of these groups in psychology in the whole at this point in time, um, but also that there's quite a bit of androcentrism. So we see, if we see studies at all, they tend to be about gay men most of all, um, then lesbians and bisexual men more than bisexual women as well. Um, I think it's important that this androcentric frame of reference for understanding um, the body was increasingly out of touch with some trends in medicine. So also in 1993, there was a reform of the National Institute of Health, which shifted practices in clinical trials away from using white men as the standard for clinical trials towards a more inclusive paradigm that necessarily included women and members of ethnic minorities. Um, and certainly attempt to replicate some of these biological studies with women in the 1990 were vexed. Um, Hamer, fa Hamer failed to replicate his genetic study in part because the way that women self-describe their sexualities was not so dichotomous as men, um, and even when findings were, were discovered that seemed to tell us what the lesbian body looked like, the focus in popular discourse remained focused on explaining male homosexuality more than lesbianism. Third area, developmental psychology, and I think this is pivotal. In 1995, volume 31, issue 1 of the APA journal Developmental Psychology was dedicated to the issue of um, sexual orientation. It started off with a number of articles that, um, in, that promoted the brain gender theory, moved through one that looked at how sexual orientation might be manifest in middle childhood um, through children's choices of gender typed play, went on to describe the kinds of problems that adolescents who are sexual minority might experience, and then went on to describe um, how well-adjusted the children of gay and lesbian parents were. Um, 
so the, the whole volume actually sort of tells kind of lifespan narrative over the course of it uh, from puberty through to parenthood uh, in which we start off with a, a sort of born that way different nature move through a period of adolescent storm and stress and then move on to happy parenthood at the end um, in a commentary on that special issue in it itself, uh, Bonnie Strickland noted uh, that there were really three questions at that point in time that loomed large for developmental psychologists about sexual orientation. First, the nature-nurture question itself. Secondly, the mental health risks that were posed by sexual orientation. Um, and lastly, the question of whether gay and lesbian people could raise children with emotional well-being. So, uh, and fourth, um, I think it's notable to point out um, the relationship between these studies and mental health. Also in the early 1990s, what we see is a shift in American psychiatry further away from uh, conversion therapies or using um, psychiatry in some kind of talking cure way to try and change people's sexual orientation. Um, so the American Psychiatric Association in 1992 deems those kinds of practices unethical because they cause psychological harm to sexual minorities themselves. And at the same time, what we see is a, a splinter group uh, break apart and form a group called NARTH, um, National Association for Research and Treatment of Homosexuality, which continues to sort of engage in this sort of stuff with um, a new Freudian line. Um, so it looks at this point in time um, as if the biological stuff is sort of warmly embraced, right? Um, it seems to undergird new developmental narratives that remove us from choice and blame. Social psychologists are doing research that seems to reify that. It seems better than the psychiatric alternatives on the block. And uh, is that enough of a reason to not wonder about gender? Um, well, some of that... My point, um, I think, tonight is to say that, that that way of thinking about things didn't stick around, right? We're not in the 1990s. Well, all that was quite new in the 1990s. We are not in the 1990s anymore. There has been, just as there was a naturalization of psychology, there's been a denaturalization in 21st century time. And I think the time where this starts to happen is in the first couple of years of the 21st century. And it happens for a few different reasons. Uh, first of all, let's go, so let's go through those kind of four areas again, social psychology, gender, developmental psychology, and mental health. Um, but what we see in the early years of the 21st century is we see social psychologists begin to look at this research anew and begin to think about essentialism um, as possibly relevant to some of this science. Um, so in work that I did, um, I kind of teased apart two dimensions of essentialist beliefs, the belief that sexual orientation is unchanging and the belief that um, gay and lesbian people are two fundamentally different kinds of people. Um, now, I wouldn't put my own study up here and say it's super historic all on its own. No. I'm, not, I'm not that much of a fragile narcissist. Uh, but but I, I think I might have been catching a zeitgeist because kind of in parallel, uh, Nick Haslam and his colleagues pretty much did exactly the same thing on the other coast of the United States. Um, so I think the sort of theories of essentialism had sort of been around long enough uh, that people were beginning to think about these things as related. And certainly, sort of, if you play the clock forward from here, now I think social psychologists are much more critical of the idea um, that promoting a biological approach to sexuality, or indeed any kind of stigmatized trait, necessarily improves attitudes in any single or one dimensional way. Um, and many of us are looking at things like the effects of attitudes on the kinds of essentialist beliefs that people are willing to tolerate. So it gets much more complicated. Secondly, let's look at gender. And I think this is where things radically shift in the early 21st century. Um, away from a kind of androcentric model where we've studied men, it's biological for men, so let's just assume that works to everybody, towards a radical gender difference model in which men's sexuality is fixed and women's sexuality is fluid, flexible, plastic, and all the rest of it. Um, there's a number of studies that sort of mark this, I think. Uh, there's some interesting literature reviews by some of the protagonists of the biological theory, like Michael Bailey and his colleagues. Um, and there's a couple of key studies uh, done by his <coughs> students, Meredith Chivers and Gerolf Rieger, uh, which I think helped to mark this gender difference paradigm. Let's look at Chivers' study as the second we're going to look at in detail. Um, so what Chivers did in this paper in 2004 is she recruited 69 men and 52 women from community newspapers in Chicago. This turns out to be a really not so great idea. It's something that they do in the Bailey lab an, a, a lot of the time and have now been critiqued for because it tends to draw people towards you from sexual minority theory, uh, communities who are a little bit more likely to believe your theory. 
and give you the kind of data that you might like. Um, the sample included uh, 11 trans women, male to female transsexual people. Um, all of the participants were shown six uh, two-minute pornographic films in a psychological laboratory, which varied the sex of actors and actions in a dimly lit private room, seated in a comfortable recliner with a television <laughs> monitor five feet away. Um, and physiological arousal as well as self-report is measured to each film using penile plus tomography or vaginal pulse amplitude. Um, relative, I'm looking at physiological arousal relative to a baseline neutral film depicting landscapes and fauna and God, God forbid that's your thing or uh, you would have given some very anomalous readings altogether. Um, so what did they, the, the data analysis here is complex, and, but what they measure essentially is the male-female contrast, for both for genital arousal, both flow flow, um, or subject for arousal, which is your self-report, say how much this, this turns you on and you find it arousing. So how much do you think the male stuff, which is images of, of men engaged in sexual acts, is more arousing than images of two women engaged in sexual, sexual acts? Um, there's no correlation between genital arousal and subjective arousal at all. So there they're different from each other. That's all that sort of tells us. And lots of participants had to be excluded um, for various reasons. About a third of the cisgender men had to be excluded because, and this is common, about a third of men do not have penises that you can measure with penal plasmography. This varies with body weight and a whole bunch of other different kinds of things. Um, so so here is, here, is, here is the data, really. Um, and um, what I'm interested here, in some ways, are the, are the narratives that are drawn from data, right? The kinds of meta theory that psychologists bring in uh, that tell us what the data means and what we should do with it and how we should live our lives accordingly. And even though this is quite a short report, um, it's a very short article, it's only about six pages, uh, there, there is a quite clear prescription about what you should do with your sexual arousal by the end. And as you'll see, it varies a lot for men and women. So the finding for men here is, um, for men who claim that they're attracted to females, straight men, um, they clearly are showing more arousal to the female stimuli, uh, gay men showing more arousal to the male stimuli, um, women vary their sexual orientation, and they're a little bit aroused to everything. It's not so clear. So it's looking fluid and flexible. It's looking like a gender difference, and that's the key message of the paper. The other key message of the paper, which we might um, draw on in the question and answers, is um, the transsexual subjects, um, who are women, of course, look more like the men. So there's something quite cisgenderist here about saying, you know, these transgender subjects are actually really more like men than are women, even though these people who identify as women, right? And I'm sure have struggled to do so. Um, so, so, so what do we draw out of this? What, what's the moral lesson for us all um, from uh, this little exploration of pornography? Um, here's what Chivers and her colleagues say at the end of their paper. Our results suggest that women have a non-specific pattern of arousal to sexual stimuli. They do not imply that women's sexual orientation is inherently bisexual. Um, for example, despite the capacity to become sexually aroused to both male and female sexual stimuli, women do not have higher rates of same-sex sexual activity than men. The large majority of women in contemporary Western societies have sex exclusively with men. Okay, heterosexuality, still there, not a problem, right? Um, similarly, the large majority of women in these societies report much higher attraction to men than to women. I know that's stating the obvious, but let's say it again just in case there was any little cracks in the edifice there. Um, and this is where I think I'm starting to see gender differences really sort of looming large in the literature. A self-identified heterosexual woman would be mistaken to question her sexual identity because she became aroused watching female-female erotica. Uh, most heterosexual women experience such arousal as they have done in this study, right? Um, and I think this is interesting because many more women were probably exposed to female-female erotica in 2004 than at earlier points in history. On, on the other hand, a self-identified heterosexual male who experienced substantial arousal to male-male erotica would be statistically justified <laughs> in, in reconsidering his sexual identity. Now, I know historians, compared to my psychology students, statistical justification doesn't loom so large for you, but it's terribly important to psychologists, I, I, I can reassure you. Um, however, perhaps we should be, remember that we are a strange tribe in that result, and, and not everybody requires statistical justification for the sexuality. <laughs> but the point I want to kind of make here is, is just to think about the kinds of prescriptions that are going on here, um, which are, are somewhat at odds with some other statements that Chivers has made about her data, which is um, that you know everybody should explore these feelings irrespective of gender. But at least in this paper, um, she's sort of saying, well, what would this mean for women? Actually, it wouldn't necessarily mean um, 
that, that you're a lesbian or, or bisexual, uh, but for men it certainly does. So she's giving us a very, so things are looking very fixed, very binary for men, but quite fluid uh, and vague for women. Um, in 2000, Roy Baumeister, who's a very eminent social psychologist, published a large review of gender differences in sexuality, the first of a few that he published. Um, and some of the conclusions of his paper, I think, show what some of the stakes for power might be um, in this model of female fluidity or female flexibility. Uh, in this paper, he notes that, that women are much more flexible in their sexualities than men are, um, and reviews a wide range of findings that affect, uh, concluding that these findings reverse one cultural stereotype, which is that civilization is male, whereas women are closer to nature. In sexuality, at least, women are the creatures of meaning, uh, which invokes the sociocultural context. I thought men lived there too myself. Whereas men are the creatures of nature, of course these differences are, are relative and, and not absolute, which is, which is good to know. Um, <laughs> and Baumeister makes a number of quite gendered prescriptions towards the end of this, this large review, um, which I think for those of us concerned about patriarchal power, it should be a bit of a worry. A, a society that needs to change in sexual behavior in order to survive or flourish would do better to target its messages and other pressures at women rather than men because of the greater difficulty in changing the sexual desires and habits of men. In simple terms, sexual compromise will be easier for women than men to the extent that the road to utopia runs through the bedroom. Social engineers may find male inflexibility presents the greater problem, whereas female plasticity represents the more promising opportunity. Okay, um, so I think, interestingly, while the notion of female flexibility and fluidity is often represented as a liberal development, it certainly capitalised on some feminist critiques of the earlier androcentric science. These kinds of comments, I think, should give us a uh, pause for thoughts about um, the territory that we now live in in the 21st century. Um, Developmental psychology, third area. Um, it, it, the journal Developmental Psychology in 2008 um, had a second special issue devoted to sexual orientation, which, which often referenced the 1995 um, issue, and it was remarkable how much had changed. This is drawn from the first article of that paper, which is Lisa Diamond's uh, Longitudinal Research on Sexual Minority Women, um, a group that she studied over a 10-year period who were um, more likely than not to change their sexual identity label um, over a 10-year period and in all possible directions. Um, Diamond is, is more reflexive about the politics of her work than some other authors um, in this territory, to be sure. But what's interesting about this special issue is that there are about two or three papers at the start that are focused on women and focused on questions about fluidity and the breakup of sexual orientation categories um, before we get into the more traditional materials. Lastly, um, psychiatry, as I mentioned, North forms in 1992. Uh, by the end of the 1990s, it starts to flex its muscle um, in the public sphere and starts to put ads in the New York Times um, about um, conversion therapy and so on. Um, and in 2003, we see uh, Robert Spitzer uh, publishes an article in Archives of Sexual Behaviour uh, claiming that conversion therapy can change sexual orientation for some people. Um, which I, I think, again, I think sort of revives that idea that the nature theory was in some ways very pro-gay um, by, by raising the spectre of that. Uh, Spitzer then later apologised to the gay community. Um, closer to the, the centre of psychology and perhaps more important um, to think about uh, is a paper in 2003 by Ilan Meyer um, which encoded the idea of minority stress as the dominant view for thinking about sexual minority and mental health. Uh, the idea here being that um, gay people are affected by stigma um, and the stigma causes poor mental health of which um, people internalise uh, to a certain degree. And I think uh, here's one model of how this might work from a, a paper by Hudson Bieler by 2009 um, of how stigma might get under the skin of people. Um, this is a, this, there are some interesting controversies here um, because Meyer endorses the notion of internalised homophobia, uh, which itself can, of course, be a rationale for undermining um, LGB people's accounts of themselves. But I think what we see here is the fulfilment of a marriage of a kind of identitarian way of thinking about sexuality um, and um, a sort of a nice sort of stream of funding on health. Um, so minority stress certainly becomes the rubric within which a lot of health and mental health studies get framed and funded in the United States in the, in the 21st century.
So these are just some 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 notes, really, um, to let you know a little bit of what I'm thinking about about the recent history of psychology and denaturalization in 21st century time. Um, so so why might this be useful, and what might it do? Um, well, I think few few communities in the history of psychology I want to speak to with this. First of all, uh, there's, there's a gang of people, um, particularly in this country, who are very interested in Ian Hacking's notion of humankind as a way of organising the history of psychology. The idea that psychology involves looping effects between um, the profession and the public, which change the objects of study and make psychology very historical. Uh, so I'm thinking of uh, Jeff Bunn's book, The Truth Machine, Pete Lamont's book, Extraordinary Beliefs, and you can probably think about this too. Um, I think, can sexuality be inserted into this framework? I think the interesting answer to that question is people have tried to do it and it hasn't gone terribly well. Um, so for example, the philosopher Edward Stein um, uses Hacking's notion of humankind in his book Disorders of Desire to make sense of this kind of material uh, and ultimately alights on the idea that what sexuality is is a natural humankind, which as Hacking says actually kind of blurs the dichotomy in such a way that it no longer becomes very meaningful. So um, uh, what I kind of want to say back to my colleagues in the history of psychology about the humankind idea is that sexuality might be a limit case for that form of analysis. Um, and it, the way in which the humankind argument has been applied psychology might be part of the recent history that we need to historicize rather than the lens that we need to bring to it. Um, I'm also aware that I'm historicizing a period where psychology increasingly ceded ground to the neurosciences. Um, in its understanding of nature and the psyche and the mind and adjustment and all sorts of things. It's a period which, uh, you know, as Vidal had argued, brainhood becomes more emblematic of selfhood and all the rest of it. Um, Rose and Abi Rashad, in their 2013 book Neuro, um, emphasise quite rightly, I think, how the idea of biological determinism um, has never really stuck as the master narrative for neuroscience, and rather the idea of brain plasticity is what organises um, funding around neuroscience, particularly in this country, and probably as a result of Obama's new initiative too. Um, and to scholars here who are looking at the neuroscience, I would urge a look at sexuality as a way in which we might think about um, the landscape of the brain and the notion of plasticity as being uh, gendered to begin with. Um, so I think neurofolk uh, need to particularly look at the arguments of people like Victoria Pitt-Taylor about the ways in which gendered sociality are being materialised in the brain and the way the mirror neuro system is being talked about, and I'd like to draw on some of that here. Third, uh, Graham Richards has long convincingly argued that American psychology is odd and distinct because of its enduring moral project. Um, and certainly, morality is all over um, the material I'm working on here. Um, and what counts as morality changes over this point in time. Uh, the morality of being inclusive, uh, the morality of being social constructions, the mor morality of recognizing people, and so on. Um, in particular, I think we can kind of use this argument uh, of morality to help people um, in psychology to recognize something very important, uh, which is that cultures can change and that sexualities can change over historical and cultural time. One very kind of moralistic impulse in psychology at the moment is this thesis about the sexualization of culture. Culture is said to be changing because of the influence of the internet, uh, direct marketing to children, particularly girls, um, and some other things. But I'm kind of interested in the way that some of these things also require us to challenge what the concepts are in psychology and to challenge some um, seemingly social constructionist essentialisms. So for example, in the 1970s, the period I'm trying to distance myself from, psychologists such as John DiCecco posed in, a, in an anti-essentialist move that sexuality had many components. It could be understood as identity, behavior, desire, fantasy, and that all these things were very different from each other. Um, and later on, people like Fritz Klein would measure them all as different variables, and, and that all seems very anti-essentialist. But of course, this essentializes those different components as being the components of sexuality themselves. And I think our experience of internet-mediated sexuality throws these into relief. So along with Michael Ross, I would argue that things like cyber sex, for example, blur the boundaries between fantasy and behavior, right? What, what are we doing if we're chatting online? Is it behavior or not? Um, and certainly if we look at um, disagreements within couples as to whether cheating has actually happened or not, we seem as a culture to be very unclear as to whether <coughs> sexual behaviour has happened or merely fantasy, which might be okay for some people. 
Um, so these are some of the stakes. Um, I think I will spare you a long argument about type 2 time, uh, except to say that in going forward with this, this project, I'm not just thinking about sexuality, but also thinking about what sexuality might offer us um, for critiquing other kinds of nature-nurture debates that might be quite moralistic. Um, I've been teaching about this material for the last two years in Surrey to final year psychology students, and their task has been to review the material, to review one other nature-nurture debate, and to put them all together and to tell me whether nature-nurture debates should continue in psychology or not. Um, and so they have been talking about body weight, they've been talking about hearing voices, they've been talking about psychosis, they've been talking about ADHD, they've been talking about intelligence, they've been talking about handedness, they've been talking about creativity, they've been talking about a very wide range of topics. Um, and in various ways we have been convincing each other that sexuality might be a way of taking us beyond uh, nature-nurture debate, <coughs> um, perhaps in part because sexuality is less stigmatised than it was at the start of the period I'm looking at. So in going forward to this project, um, I'm thinking very much about my role as a person who is going to continue to teach history to psychology students. That's what I'm going to continue to do. I said at the start that I'm not a historian and I've, I've no desire to discipline switch with this work either. Um, and these students must deal with the inheritance of psychology's moralizing project. They must deal with psychology's capacity to naturalize social kinds and it's, they must deal with its ongoing tensions with the neurosciences. So what I want to argue is that a recent history of sexuality might offer these students quite a lot indeed, and not least the conclusion that nature and nurture are not just opposites, nor are they antagonists, nor are they mutually constitutive, and nor are they just interactive, um, but rather that they are a binarizing framework that obscures the very real way that the psychology of sexuality is the history of the present. Thank you. Thank you.